Angua. I am an Android engineer. I am a Google developer expert for Android. I've been doing Android for now, I would say almost uh, 10 years, but I've been doing software engineering for more. And um, it's been an honor to just be out here in the community trying to teach others how to code and also sharing my knowledge. Now, I did not start talking until recently. I think my first talk was actually in 2019. So I spent most of my career just working, you know, coding. And then I decided, let me be out here, just uh, seeing how I can help move the community into coding. Now we're going to be talking about building high quality Android application for the modern world. And one thing that I want us to know is that everyone here today has a mobile app, right? Everybody here has a, also a mobile phone. Let me say just a mobile phone. We have iOS and we have Android. So I'm going to walk us through just a quick journey due to time of what these are, give the differences, and just look at, a, look at a little bit of code. And then I'll share some slides for later. And also if you have questions, I'm always available on LinkedIn to answer any questions. Now, let's look at the mobile landscape. So we, in, in terms of the operating system, we have Android and we have iOS. So how many of us here use Android applications by show of hands? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I rarely see so many people using Android applications, but that's cool. I'm gonna use iOS. Okay, everybody. <laughs> I like that ratio. <laughs> cool. Now, it makes me happy that I did see a lot of hands on the Android, so I'm pretty cool. So that's how it's, it's divided, Android and iOS. Now, if you want to build for Android, this is what you do. You will use either Kotlin or Java. Now, when I started my career, we were using Java, but right now it's recommended if you want to build for Android, use Kotlin. Now, if you want to build for iOS, which is our counterpart, our competitors, you will use Swift or Objective-C. Now, something to note is that I did notice a switch. So before they were using Objective-C and now they use Swift. And finally, you can build for both, which is you can build for both iOS and Android at the same time. And you, if you want to do that, you can use Flutter. We do have a Flutter GDE here today. He will talk about that. And then also you can use React Native. And when I was writing this slide, I didn't notice that um, KMM, which is Kotlin multi-platform, wasn't very stable, but I feel like right now it is, but you can look into it. It's another way you can build for multi-platform. Let's move forward. Now, Android development is actually developed. So Android is by Google, and what makes Android very powerful is it's open source. How many of us know what open source means? Amazing, I love that. So it means any developer can easily go there and make contributions. On the other side though, if you want to build for Android, because most of us here maybe have never heard about that and I've never done that, you will use an IDE called Android Studio, which is you will have to download an ID, that ID and start coding in it. Now, the language again there is still Java. Now, iOS, as we all know again, it's in-house, closed, so it's not open source. And to be fair, I feel like the barrier to entry for iOS if you ask me, it's pretty high because you have to pay $99 a year to even deploy on their platform. Whereas for, for Google, you only pay $25, I think, forever, which is super cool. So if you're from, let's say, a background where you're not able to afford that, it will be very hard for you to maintain it. So those are kind of the barriers that I've noticed over the years. Now, if you want to build for iOS, you will use something called Xcode, and the language again there, it's gonna be Swift. Now, for, again, the hybrid is just going to be, those are the symbols that you'll use for hybrid. I did not talk much about the hybrid. Let's see, so in this slide, I define what they are, so you can look into this once I'm done, and just see what they do individually. Now, my talk, it's actually built in high quality Android application. Now that I've walked you through like what it is, I mean the mobile landscape, we'll talk about we'll talk about what actually makes a modern Android application or just an application. And things that you have to consider are like UI UX design. And in Android, we use the material design. And in iOS, if you want to build for iOS, you will use something called the human interface 
guideline, which is high HG. Very important things to consider when you're building for the modern world. Now, let's talk about Android. Let's download down to Android. Now, because I'm an Android expert. When we talk about Android, when you look at this particular slide, I'm going to talk about a new language, or let me t think about it as um, a new decorative way of building for the modern world, which is using Jetpack Compose. If you're a developer who started building Android, let's say back in 2014, we did not have all this fancy stuff. If you ask me, I feel like it's, it's made developers' life much easier, and I truly, truly love it. And now I'm able to flex actually when I'm coding, like, wow, I can do this pretty fast, so it's pretty cool. In Jetpack Compose, this is the definition, so I will not work through the entire definition, but I wanted to just showcase what it is, which is just a modern UI toolkit for building Android apps using the declarative approach. Before that, though, we used to build with XML, and that was pretty painful if you ask me. I would take forever just searching, how can I put a top bar? How can I put a bottom navigation? Right now, you just call something called the scaffold, and then you can have the top bar, the bottom bar, and your content. And I'll show a little bit of that. Now, here you'll see, I, thought I wanted to be fair, you know, I didn't want to leave the people who might want to also look into Swift just pending, because I noticed a lot of similarities in what's now out there in the modern Android app, in the modern Android world. And in Swift, you just create, I mean, for them, they use a Swift UI, which is pretty similar to Jetpack Compose, and I'll show how through the code. Now, something else that also really captured my eye is the fact that Jetpack Compose was actually, was actually released in 2019, and Swift was also released the same year. The adoption, however, has really increased now. As you can see, there are more developers now using Jetpack Compose and more developers are using Swift. And you will be mind blown when I start showing the code. Now, through just talking, how we just can build modern application, especially for Android. And here you'll see that with Compose, and I know a lot of these words are going to be a tech jargon, but on your own time, the idea is to just introduce something that you can go look into if you're really interested in building for mobile apps. Now, you see there with Compose, you can actually do view model integration, handling life cycles, which are things that were very hard to do back in the days. But right now, all these things are simplified for us. Now, you're able to also handle immutable state by ensuring that your states are very well like handled. You have pretty well UI life cycles when you rotate your application. Because for those who used applications back in the days, if you downloaded an app, and then you rotated it, everything was thrown out of place. So as developers, what we do, we lock the app to like portrait mode, which is a very bad hack. But right now we don't have to do all that. Things are simplified for us, so it's pretty easy to build. Now there's also testing and debugging, which is very important when you're building high quality ap applications. Because so you want to make sure that you test your applications and they are very well tested before they go to the users. Data fetching is very important because most of most of our work is Android, not Android, but mobile developers, is more about just fetching the data and displaying the data on the phone. So we want to make sure that when you're working on that particular feature, it's very well done and you, your users are not struggling. And then finally on this part, what I want to talk about is just utilizing the latest patterns that are great, that are recommended now. Because when I started doing Android, we only had MVC, which is a model view controller. Right now, we've got a model view, more model, model view intent, which are pretty good patterns to follow. Now, we cannot have good Android, good Android applications or even iOS without optimizing for performance. So I would highly recommend when you're doing that, build in, ensure that you optimize for performance. And this can be through, let's say, using Compose tools that are now available for all the developers, using profilers that you can actually view your screens, you know, like when you're building, you're able to see all your views the way they lie up on top of each other so that you don't create views that are very complex, and also using common best practices that are there. This is just to highlight our documentation has really, really helped us developers. Now, we also have to ensure we're handling well threadings and curtains. Lazy loading, which is super great now, because you're able to just create a lazy column, 
and then just page nature your staff, which which when we, when we started building, I can say it was a really big thing. But right now, you're able to build pretty easily. Let me see what my time is. Okay, so we got time. Now, I want to jump forward to, oh yeah, now show me the code, which is the part where I wanted us to look into. Now, uh, this is how an Android text looks like. If, so I'm gonna pause a little bit here and ask all of us here, how many of us here have built for mobile, either iOS or Android? Pretty cool, pretty cool, I love that. Now, most of you have not done that, but that's why I wanted to create simple code snippets that people can understand. Now, a text is a component, let's say, in mobile. For instance, if you open any application, you'll see some text. This is how we create a text in Android. Look at how that code looks, and you'll see the next slide, and you'll see how it really compares. This is how a text in iOS looks like. So you'll notice a pretty good similarity. So in Android, what we're just doing is, we have that text where we define jet by compose text. We have a style, style in our text, and then we have a modifier. So a modifier, think about, I think of it like just a decorator for that particular text. That decorator, you can say, I need this text to have this particular color. I want this text to do like this when it's clicked. I need this text to have this particular size and all that cool stuff. And in iOS, it's pretty similar. They have, they don't have like a modifier, but you can see they have the patterns, they have the font, and it's the same. They pass in like just the name. So pretty cool. Another very important thing that's used, let's say in Android, is the outline text. Everybody here has logged in somewhere, right? Like enter your username and password. That is it. That's how we build it. Now that's how it looks. You have the value, and then when the value changes, you listen to that. You have the label and then you have your modifier and all that. Now look at the iOS one. Pretty similar. Like, so the point of showing you this is just how right now you're able to build for both of them if you have a knowledge for one. And to me, if you ask me as a developer, do I think, like, do I think this is a good, I really think this is a good thing because I'm able to jump in and help like iOS engineers if they get stuck, same for them too. Which brings up which brings up the point. So should we just build for using Flutter or React Native? I think to me the only thing I've noticed that I can say is the only strength is that some companies prefer to have each code base just laid on by its own because of complexity. Because the more the app grows, the more complexity it gets. But being able to jump in from one code to another and just be able to help and understand the code is very good too. Now, uh, let's look at how the button looks. Buttons are everywhere. This is how a button looks in Jetpack Compose. And as you can see, you get a button, and all this is Kotlin. For whoever is wondering, this is Kotlin. The one I'm showing in iOS is Swift. Now, here you'll see that the button, you have like a not click lambda, that you can do something once the button is clicked. And then you have your modifier decorating your button. And then you have a text that says this particular button is called Jetpack Compose button. That's how you create a button in Jetpack Compose. So here, when we leave this talk, I'm hoping everyone is gonna be interested in creating something in for Android or for iOS. Now, this is how an iOS button looks like. Can you even tell the difference? I'm just gonna go through the behind slide. That's that is Android. Just look at it. That is iOS. Can you tell the difference? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought too as a developer when I was looking at it and I was like, wow, so it's pretty interesting how both of these particular frameworks look pretty the same. And I wondered, wow, so what are they trying to do? I think to me, I would say they're trying to make our lives easy as developers. And quote me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it really increases developers' productivity. Now, let's look at something interesting here. One thing that I have to acknowledge is that the logic is going to be different, right? Because the logic of how we write all these particular functions is going to be different from Android and iOS. But your UI will look a little bit similar, you'll notice, and then it will also help you move faster if you get stuck. 
Now here you'll see I have a column and then that column I have an image and a text. If you're a visual person, you'll see a column, image and text. That's how you created now in Genpa Compose. And here, that's how it looks in iOS. Now iOS uses something that's different called the VStack. So that's going to be a vertical stack. So then they don't see the column that we do, but that's the only difference that I've seen that's maybe major and then horizontal stack too and others. But overall, it all looks pretty similar. That's how you create a row in Android. As you can see there, what we're doing in that code, we're just saying we have a row that has an image and then we have a column that has two texts. That is a title and subtitle. And then the image is just my image. If you're a visual person, that's how it should look like. An image and then two texts, text, text, image. How would you build that in iOS? This is how it would look like. An H stack and then an image and then a V stack, text, text. And then you should be able to have something similar. And um, the other reason as to why I wanted to even showcase this is that there are jobs like, let's say, mobile architects that are that companies are always hiring for. In a mobile architect, you need to understand how you can build either both applications or manage both applications. And once you know this secret, because most of so most of the people that I've interacted with, especially in the Android world, they're like, I've never touched any Swift code. And I'm like, really? You've not looked into it? I'm like, not interested. And I'm like, are you sure? It's very, very easy. And I was like, oh, and then I convinced them and they go and they're like, oh, actually, I can build for iOS too. Like, am I now an iOS developer? So it was a secret that I noticed and I was like, these languages look the same and it's very easy to build upon them. Now, radio groups are very important too, like in an application when you're building. So you'll see in, in any app, you'll notice some radio groups. That's those tiny groups where you're able to select. That's how you build them. And as you can see here, it's made so easy for us in Android now because we just have to call the composable function radio pattern and just put the stuff we want to put in. Now, something I always encourage developers when you're building, especially now with Jetba Compose, since you're able to create so many customizable functions that you can call and use, always click into the thing you want to build. For instance, if it's a radio button you want to customize, click into it, right? Check what it takes. After you discover what it takes, see if you can build yours and make it take the things that you want, giving it specifications. Now, uh, let's look at an iOS. It looks pretty similar to radio group. And then it has all the view and then the VStack and all that stuff. Pretty cool, pretty similar. And I hope you're inspired. Now, let me see. Oh, something also very important that we use in Android is a card. And for those who've seen cards, it's just, see the way my slide looks, like a card. Those are cards, and they're very useful in um, the, modern Android, the modern world, and especially when you're building for people these days who are very picky with UI, they would want to see plenty good UI. This is how you build it, and that's how you, you just say the card, call the card, and then give it whatever you want to give it. And I think in iOS, that's how it will look like, where you can have like a Z stack, round and rectangle, and then you pass in the stuff you want. Now, I'm going to skim through due to time to one slide that I wanted to showcase. Now, this is a KMM card. I wanted to showcase just how, because, so the advantages of using, let's say, if you ask me, the advantages of using, let's say, Kotlin multi-platform is that it's, it's one language too. And if you know, let's say, Kotlin, you'll be able to build for both. And like, let's say, if you decided, should I start with React Native? Should I start with, let's say, Flutter? Or should I start just natively? If you decide to go with this, sometimes it's just based on company's need. Because most of the time it's going, I mean, unless you're an indie developer. I mean, if you are an indie developer, I highly recommend go Flutter. It's pretty easy. But if your company is the one that's making the decisions and they say, hey, I don't want to, I, we're not going flatter, then you can always learn all these particular languages. The KMM way, I feel like it's going to be, I don't think it was very stable like I mentioned in the beginning, but I think it's also very straightforward because it's similar. You build just using Kotlin and everything else you're able to see. Now, I wanted to skim the one part of them. Um, 
my code a little bit due to time and showcase something here. Let me see. I'm just gonna walk through it with my slider. I, the lady is not here yet, so point my time. Okay. Now for the code, so what I've done in those slides, I just showcased how those components are. Now, everybody here is looking at me like, Madonna, can you show us how we can actually build something so that I'll get inspired and go start building? Let's build this. I'm going to also rush through it due to time. But the goal is going to be to create an app that displays a list of items fetched from an API. We're going to do a lot of pseudocode, but it should work once you set it up on your laptop when you get time to set it out. So the first thing that you will need to do is to ensure that those are there, which are the things that you will need, especially for Jennifer Compose, that is telling Compose to be true and then setting up the UI. And then the next thing that you'll need is you'll need to be able to build your user interface. And here, as you can see, what we're doing is that we are creating this main screen. We are calling the scaffold, as I said, which the scaffold, okay. The scaffold has the app bar, and the app bar is just like, in the app, when you open the app, you'll have item list, and then you have the content, which is the item list, and then here, you should be able, oh, oh that was too fast. And then here, we should be able to just call the item list composable. How does the item list composable look like? Let's go there. So the item list looks like this. As you can see, it's a composable function too. It takes two parameters, which is the list of item, and then it takes an on click. So when we click the items, what happens? Now, we use this lazy column to display the list because it's a list of items. And then in the item, again, what we're just doing is like we're looping through this list of, list of items and then getting the text, which is the item.name. I'll show you how the item data class looks like. And then here, as you can see, once we go to the next one, oh, hold on. Let me go back here a little bit. So here, as you can see, once we click, we should be able to navigate to another destination. Now, how we create navigation in Compose, it's pretty easy too. We just set a sold class screen, which is now the detail, and then we define a route. Now, we have a starting point, which is the main, and then the detail screen will just give it a string, which is the root of details. Now, we have the item ID because we are navigating with some arguments from the beginning screen, string, screen sorry. So once we click, we are able to get that item ID and navigate with it. How does a detail screen look like? This is how it looks like. So we fetch the items from our API, and then here, as you can see, we're just using a scaffold for the detail screen too, because if you're a visual person, think about it like this. The first screen is the entry point. The, ne the next screen, which is the detail screen, is after the entry point. So you enter, you click, you navigate to this detail screen. And then that's why you see that you have another scaffold that has a top bar, which is the item detail, and then the text with the items name. Now, handling navigation events is also very easy when you're building for modern apps. And this is how you do it. You just say nav controller dot navigate. This is the route. So it's pretty straightforward when you're navigating. Again, also calling the nav bar. And then finally, when you're fetching the data, what do you do? Create a function to get the item, the list, you're returning the list of items. And as you can see here, we are returning the list of the items. How do the items look like? This is how the items look like. So this is just a data class of an ID and a name. Think about it like that. So we can get as many as we want. For instance, if you want to build, use it less in the Pokemon API, you can go look at the object and create a data based on that particular object. And um, in the main activity, this is how we'll have it. And we have a complete running app. You'll see there we'll have the set content and then the main screen and then start our app. And recap, so today we looked at mobile landscape. Sorry, I feel like I rushed it, but I hope you learned something. And then we looked at Jetpack Compose. And then we looked at Compose components. I know we chose a little bit of tech jargon in the beginning, but hopefully you can look at these terms later because they do make a lot of impact, especially when you're building for the modern apps, because you don't want people to download apps, your apps, and then they look floppy, people will download and people will move on. So you want to make sure that you're building 
pretty high quality apps. And then it's always a continuous learning because we are always learning to make better apps and also make good applications that people can enjoy using. And I do have a book where I talk about how to build for modern agile applications using Jetpack Compose. And the recipes here are very easy to follow and you can build an entire app and even get started or get into the mobile world, which is, a, which is something that I'm very proud of that I did this year. And you can connect with me there. <laughs> and that's it, thank you very much. <laughs>